Hello, uh, I'm Ronald Davis. I'm a professor of biochemistry and genetics at Stanford University. I'm also the director of the Stanford Genome Technology Center, uh, which developed a lot of the technology for the Genome Project. I'm also the chair of the, the Scientific Advisory Committee for the Open Medicine Foundation, which supports uh, chronic fatigue syndrome research. And I'm here to talk about chronic fatigue syndrome. It's a really devastating disease. Um, my son is struck with it, and he's very severe. Uh, and so this illustrates a little bit about how bad this disease can be, which is pr largely unknown. Uh, and in his case, um, he's totally bed bound. Uh, he cannot eat, and so we feed him by a tube into the top of his intestine, going through his stomach wall. He can't swallow, so we have to give him fluid IV that is a line in his chest that goes into his heart. Uh, he also can't talk. He cannot read. He cannot look at numbers. He cannot look at letters. Uh, he cannot look at us because it's too stressful. Uh, if we are in the room, he has to cover his eyes. He's super sound sensitive, uh, which means uh, we can't talk to him. Uh, and we can't even make any small noises. It's also super smell sensitive, so um, we can't cook in our kitchen in the house uh, because the smell will really bother him. And uh, so uh, this is not an unusual case. There are literally thousands of people all over the world that are this severe. Many of them are so severe that they choose suicide. So uh, it's very common to have a patient commit suicide, which is really unfortunate. In my son's case, he had a number of friends before he got super sick and was co corresponding them with them uh, on the internet, and a couple of them committed suicide, which really bothered him. Uh, so this is a real devastating disease. Uh, it probably affects around 1% of the population. That's a rough estimate. I think many of the estimates uh, are, are under-reporting it because uh, there's not an easy way to figure out how many people have this. They frequently don't go to doctors. Um, they often don't have any insurance coverage. Uh, there's just no easy way to access it. You can get a little bit of an idea for the less severe patients. Uh, I do know that the CDC made phone calls on landlines to households to try to determine this, uh, but of course, a MECFS patient will never answer the phone. Uh, so it's really tough to really get an accurate number. It's also really expensive. Um, uh, they often require, if they're very severe, a caretaker. Some of them require 24-7 care. And uh, uh, it's not uncommon for, a, even with insurance coverage, to spend over $100,000 to take care, a year, to take care of one of these patients. Now the disease itself uh, affects multiple organ systems. Uh, it does not uh, seem to have a major effect on the heart or the liver or the kidneys, which is what physicians often look at. Uh, it's not an organ type disease, it's systemic. It, it affects the brain, it affects the immune system, uh, it affects the digestive system. And uh, uh, there's many, many symptoms that, that come from those. Um, because it affects the brain, it's been viewed in the past as a uh, psychosomatic disease. They simply believe they're sick. <clears throat> and that's when they measure things like cholesterol level. It's perfectly normal. Now, I described my sons to you. And if you do all the things that the doctors normally will do when they look at a patient, um, uh, all of those things look normal. And uh, th that's because those systems are not particularly affected, but many, many other things are. So the patients have been ignored for a very long time. There's very little funding, uh, and that's a serious problem. And uh, this disease has been ignored for many, many years. It's something that people should be a little scared of because uh, you can come down with this disease at uh, almost any time of your life except when you're particularly young. 
So uh, the incidents really start in the teenage, late teenage years. Uh, one of the common things is um, uh, Epstein Barr virus infection, which leads to a disease called mononucleosis. Uh, one study found that 10% of uh, students that came down with mononucleosis convert to chronic fatigue syndrome. And, and with our current level of understanding of this disease, if you get chronic fatigue syndrome or MECFS, uh, your life as you know it, it's over. And uh, that is really sad because it hits people with such uh, the prime of their life. <coughs> now, uh, there's a lot of other things that can cause this disease. Any stressor can cause this disease. Um, there are uh, many types of infections, viral infections, that can cause it. Um, in Australia, I think it's the Ross River virus infections can cause this. Um, it can also be caused by Giardia, that an epidemic occurred in Norway. Uh, but any other types of stressors, like an auto accident, uh, surgery, uh, uh, childbirth, uh, anything that is a major body stressor uh, can cause this disease. So everybody, as far as we can tell, is vulnerable to this and uh, there's nothing you can do to really protect yourself. So what is needed is, is uh, research funding and uh, that's needed throughout the world. I really urge uh, government and private donors to find high-level, high-quality researchers and support them. Uh, it, it, this is not an easy disease to work on. There are a lot of other things that are much easier to work on. I, I think we need to do, induce people to study this disease. Uh, it, it's been unknown for a very long time. It's been uh, felt it's not a very serious disease, but in fact it's an extremely serious disease. Uh, there are a number of physicians that treat AIDS patients as well as uh, MACFS patients, and they would all claim that uh, if they had a choice, they would take AIDS over MACFS. <coughs> so I, I particularly uh, would like to appeal to uh, uh, anybody that's in uh, uh, the, the high tech field that has earned a great deal of money uh, that, in fact, you can make a major contribution by attacking this disease. Uh, because it has so little funding, uh, even uh, m modest donations will actually make a, a fairly large difference. We really need to have well f a number of sites that are very well funded uh, and that, that can also work together. So our model really is to not just focus on collecting some data and publishing it, but in fact really focus on what can happen to make the patients better or also find what is actually the origin of this disease. What's the fundamental problem? If we can do that, we might have a chance of actually curing the patients. Uh, I, I think uh, a modest amount of funding would help tremendously, but if you are very serious about it, um, when I was doing the Genome Project, we had funding levels of around $10 million a year. Uh, which is actually a very effective way to run a laboratory because um, what you do at, at that level of funding is you recruit high low high quality people that are dis have multiple uh, disciplines um, like electrical engineering, computer science, uh, 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 a degree in medicine, uh, biochemists, a geneticist, uh, cell biologist, uh, and just do the whole gamut of um, of d discipline so when you attack a problem uh, you can bring together experts in those particular areas to try to address it. <coughs>